Sure. Um, I'm a corporate risk professional. Uh, I'm the president of a company called Cetracon Incorporated, uh, or uh, we're known as Cetracon Enterprise Security Risk Management Services. Now, that's a long phrase to say <laughs> that what we do is we help companies with identifying risk and then developing the mitigations to make themselves resilient. Because when risk impacts a, a major company, uh, as we're seeing with uh, coronavirus right now, it has global impact. So when airlines don't fly, when trucks don't run, when supplies can't get to manufacturing plants, when food doesn't get to your shelf, uh, we try to identify those issues ahead of time and help those organizations, including small government, uh, to develop the capacity to uh, be resilient to those events and through preparedness and, and uh, training and having a plan in place before the event occurs. So it seems like we're not very uh, prepared on that on a global level right now. You know, there's a lot of stories about empty shelves and, you know, the schools are shutting down. Parents don't know what to do. It seems like even though this isn't the first natural type of a, you know, this isn't the first time Mother Nature has flexed her muscles, um, we're still here having these same conversations. So let's talk a little bit about emergency preparedness. Sure. And of course, that's on two different scales. That's on an individual basis. How prepared are we as a family or an individual or as a household? And then how are we prepared um, on the U.S. scale? Okay. Um, why, why is everybody panicking right now? Well, you know, fear is, a, is an amazing driver. And people fear what they don't know. Uh, you know, whether it's coronavirus uh, or here in the Northwest, a 9.9 .9 magnitude earthquake mm -hmm. or a severe windstorm or two feet of snow or whatever your disaster du jour is, um, we need to have a, a certain level of personal preparedness uh, that allows us to be resilient in the face of these events, to take care of ourselves, to take care of our families, to ensure that we have the things we need in, in order to survive. So to those people who are running around with their hair on fire right now, I mean, what, what would you tell those people? They're obviously not in a position where they're prepared. Right. Um, you know, what did those people need to be doing right now? What should they have been thinking about four weeks ago? Well, let's, let's talk about preparedness in the larger sense. You know, there's, there's things that we need to have. You need to have food. You need to have water. You need to have medications. You need to have first aid supplies. And you need to have a little bit of cash. Those are kind of the things that you need to be able to weather out an event. You know, so when you start looking at those things, you know, if you're taking medications, you should have a 30 to 60 day supply of those medications on hand, whatever that medication is. Um, if you, uh, you know, in a major event where there's power outages and things like that, uh, ATM machines don't work. So we're very used to walking up to the ATM machine, putting in our card, it puts out cash, and we're happy. Uh, or going to a terminal and swiping a card, and we get what we need. When those terminals aren't working, cash is king. And, you know, I'm not saying that you have to, you know, hoard thousands of dollars, but, you know, having a little bit of cash to cover the necessities in emergency uh, is, is something that you should have. Let's talk about food. Um, there's many, many different ways to approach food. There's pre, uh, pre-manufactured emergency foods. Uh, those are generally pretty expensive. A good thing to get a hold of, if you can, is the military meals ready to eat, oh, MREs. Yeah. I mean, Gotta love uh, those. you bet. I mean, uh, uh, you know, as Crocodile Dundee said, they taste like hell, but you can live off of them. <laughs> you know, so uh, each one of those is about 2,500 calories. So really, one MRE a day is all you need to live well. You know, and they're readily available. You can, there's all kinds of outlets for them. You know, people are selling them all the time on Facebook Marketplace and OfferUp and, and all these other locations. But if you've got to, you know, if you want to depend on what comes from the, the grocery store, you want to look at things that are shelf stable, things that you can keep that will not deteriorate. Or what you do is you use things that you normally use and rotate it through your stock. So I know people laugh at spam. All right. Spam is a great shelf stable food. It's very it's it's actually pretty nutritious. Uh, the lower sodium versions are actually not as as uh, bad for you as, as some of the others. But uh, it's a shelf stable food. But then you look at 
rice and beans and flour, uh, uh, oil, you know, those are the things that you need that you can build meals from those things. Um, having other canned goods on hand, you know, soups, uh, soups are great. You know, uh, a soup is a full complete meal in, in many cases, canned soup, but you know, canned vegetables, canned meats, those are all shelf stable things that you can live off of. And most times they don't even require refrigeration. So, you know, having those things on hand, if you want to get a little bit more advanced, you know, one of the things that I've done for years and that I learned as a young person is canning, you know, so you make that big pot of soup and your family eats it for a day and then they eat it the second day. And by the third day, nobody wants to look at it, but you still have a half a pot of soup instead of throwing it away or putting it, you know, uh, uh, you know, throwing away and disposing of it. Take it, put it in, in good uh, quality uh, mason jars with a, with a lid. Uh, you can pressure can by putting in a pressure cooker or you can uh, water, hot water bath can. Uh, and those things last six months to a year, eight months, two years. You know, I mean, you should rotate them out periodically and, and check the seal. But if you do that over time, what you do is you build up this stock of, of food that you have on hand that uh, in an emergency or, you know, when you forgot to go to the grocery store, you actually have something to eat, you know. So, you know, I'm watching, you know, what's going on at, at the grocery stores and what's going on at Costco and all these other places. And I'm watching people, and this just amazes me, watching people walking out with cartloads of bottled water. <laughs> now, in an earthquake, bottled water might be important. Because if it's a significant enough earthquake, then yes, uh, in-ground lines are going to break, water can get tainted, things like that. Uh, but what I do is instead of buying a bunch of bottled water, I keep life straws in all my vehicles. All right, a life straw literally is a, is a purification unit. You can stick it into a pond of water, you can draw through it, and it purifies the water uh, as, as you drink it. So, and, and they're not that expensive. Uh, I think a life straw is between 20 and 50 bucks on Amazon. Um, but there, here we are, we're looking at a virus and people are loading up on bottled water, but yet we live in a first world country where you can literally take water out of any tap and it's all managed by the US EPA and uh, Department of Health Regulations and it's very healthy to drink the water out of our taps. So, uh, you know, being selective in what you purchase you know, a lot of people are purchasing disinfectants. Well, the best disinfectant is bleach. All right, you can get chlorine bleach almost anywhere. We use it in our laundry every day. Keep an extra bottle around. A couple of drops of chlorine bleach in water is a great disinfectant for surfaces. It's a great disinfectant for about anything because nothing lives in chlorine. So, you know, it's just being smart about what you do. What advice would you give to somebody who's watching this show and says, okay, I obviously have not checked the boxes. I'm not prepared. How does one go about building a roadmap, so to speak, or a, or a plan? Um, is there a general template that you can use? I mean, is, is there what what's your general best practice for building out the plan for how much cash we're going to have, food, how are we going to deal with water? Well, you're you know you're not going to be able to do it all in one day. You know, so this is a, pro a process that takes that takes time, but. If I, have, if I was not at the personal level of preparedness that I was at today, I would be looking to get the essentials that I need every day to survive. And, and that's what I would be purchasing from the store. Um, toilet paper is nice and toilet paper works, but you know what? A washcloth soap and water works too. You know, and years ago we used to use cloth baby diapers. What do we do with them? You take them, you rinse them out, you put them in the machine, you wash them, or you put them in a bucket with soap and water, and you scrub them, and then you hang them out to dry. All right, so although toilet paper is nice, there are things to get around if you can't find toilet paper, which I find very doubtful that, that we're going to have this extended run on toilet paper. But, you know, having the essentials that you need, uh, what do you need? You need food, you need water. Water is taken care of because it's at the tap. Food is something else, and we've talked about that. So you don't have to go out and buy cases of food. Uh, I would start off with a three to seven day supply. And then 
realize what you really need to survive, all right? Uh, a human being in good health and good physical fitness needs 1,800 to 2,200 cal- 2, calories a day to, to subsist, okay? That, you know, that's not, you know, a, a, a $6,000 or, excuse me, a 6,000 calorie meal that we need three times a day. So, you know, being realistic about expectations for what it takes to survive and having those fundamental items in your home, those are the things that I would look to purchase first.